What do global giants Airbnb, Snap and Stripe have in common? My next guest, it is a General Catalyst, an early investor in all of those companies I talked about. Uh, Deepak Nasha joining us right here on ET Now. Welcome to India. Thank you. Thank you, come you very much. All the way from Silicon Valley. I believe General Catalyst is uh, now a long India bull. We've been an India bull for a while. Huh. Uh, we've made about 12 investments uh, in three years since 2019, but we've gotten more intentional and deeper into the Indian market. We've made seven new investments this year alone. Okay. And we are only in April. And we are only in April, actually. Yes, today, April 1st. <laughs> <laughs> this is no April Fool joke, ladies and gentlemen. So tell us, um, going forward, you've done 12, you said, over three years, but, but seven already. Seven additional. Seven yeah. in four months. Um, Going forward, what can we expect? Like, do you have an India fund that you're raising? Are you just doing higher allocation? What? So we just closed a $4.6 billion global fund complex uh, across three different business lines. So we have a $800 million creation fund, a $1.1 billion venture fund, and a $2.7 billion growth fund. And that will invest globally, including in India. So will we see higher allocation for India or is this, that's not how it works? Uh, we, you know, we allocate to the companies where we see <laughs> the most interesting opportunities. And yeah. India definitely, you know, is thriving and very vibrant. Huh. You know, as you may know, I've been both inside the Indian tech ecosystem and having a bird's eye view of it over the last 20 years because I used to run Asia Pacific for Google. Yes. And then it. LinkedIn as yes. the chief product officer and then uh, was a senior managing partner at SoftBank. SoftBank. And now a general catalyst. So you now I've seen the waves of uh, you know the tech ecosystem evolution in India over these twenty years, and it's uh, I I think the time is now, and it's very very vibrant and thriving. So you've come uh, from Silicon Valley. So you tell us um, how is Silicon Valley viewing India? Whatever's happening in China should and has benefited us, our founders, our startup ecosystem. <clears throat> So the the good news is that a lot of Silicon Valley right now is run by Indians. So <laughs> it's not like it's a foreign perspective. It's an indigenous perspective. Uh, most of the large tech companies and even many of the large private tech companies have very thriving technology operations here in uh, India, in various parts of India. So I think that's all very helpful. Uh, we also see a lot more Indian companies coming and selling product in the United States, yeah. especially the B2B SaaS companies. And so, you know, it's very much a mainstream view of India. So now you tell us one more thing, and that is um, what we've seen. And it's, it's a trend that started late last year. Uh, you could call it the NASDAQ whale and what happened with SoftBank. Uh, but investors falling out of love with tech. Um, the valuations uh, that had, you know, reached popcorn, this, that. I don't want to get into all of that. You know mm. it and our viewers know about it. Now it seems as if some tech companies at least are making a comeback. What is your assessment of this entire situation? So, you know, the way I think about it, and as an operator for 25 years, this is the advice we gave our teams, uh, and this is the same advice I give to our portfolio companies, which is our job is to create value, and the market's job is to figure out the valuation. And every By so value, often... value, do you also mean profit or what? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, profit is certainly an important component of value, but it's not the only component of value. Value is a very holistic metric, and we can get into that, right? Mm -hmm. But going back to your earlier question about markets and stocks falling out of favor or not, there's usually always a disconnect between value and valuation. Sometimes value outpaces valuation, and sometimes valuation outpaces value. Perhaps over the last four or five years, and especially during COVID, valuation started outpacing value, and now things are coming back into equilibrium. But at the end of the day, what can a company control? We can control value creation. We cannot control the valuation. That's always determined by an outside force. So let's focus Not on what we can control. Not because that's only when it's a stock market valuation. Otherwise, uh -huh. it's done privately. It is done privately, but it's a demand and supply thing, right? It's some investor willing to give you the value that you believe you have. Mm. But you may not get what you think you have. And ultimately, the price settles on but what? But the U.S. Fed helped, right? With bazooka after bazooka after bazooka. <laughs> that certainly helped. And that's why I said during COVID, you know, the valuations got a little bit out of hand. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of value creation happened, right? In, in the nine months, the first nine months of COVID, I think e-commerce and a lot of online commerce probably made 10 years worth of progress. Yeah. And so clearly value creation also quickened. Because we in India, of course, um, 
still new. We're trying to figure out the new age companies. We had a slew of IPOs from a Zomato to a Nika to a Paytm, and I'm sure you followed all of them very, very closely. And, and what has happened with them? So since you said that you've been in this industry for more than two decades and seen so many cycles, you tell our viewers um, how best to approach these kind of new age companies. <laughs> I, w- I wish any of us had that crystal ball. But, you know, today is actually a historic moment. The, one of the very first Indian tech companies, internet companies, completes 25 years today, Nokri.com. Yeah, it, I saw the tweet by Mr. Sanjeev Victor yes. as well. And, you know, we, I'm going to see Sanjeev and be on stage with him later this evening. Hmm. And uh, that's a fascinating moment, right? I, I believe that a lot of things that we believe we are inventing in the business context are just rediscovering the past. So being a student of history and understanding how business has evolved always helps us so we can learn from it both good and bad, yeah. and then inculcate that in today's environment. So many of the IPOs that you talked about, you know, that slew of IPOs, I don't think the Indian tech scene has ever seen that many IPOs in such a short period of time. Uh, it's great because it creates liquidity, and when you have liquidity, you have, you know, velocity of that capital going back into the ecosystem and newer companies forming. It also enables you know, the employees who work very hard at these companies to realize some returns, and obviously the investors and the founders make uh, returns from it as well. It's also helpful to keep it in context, to say, look, you know, the previous 10 years, maybe like five companies in the tech ecosystem went public, and in the last year, five went in 12 months. Mm. So you know, again, like, okay. let's, not, let's not take anything for granted and just continue building that value, and the time is right, companies will go public. If you don't get good night, good news and good price together, unfortunately, <laughs> on the stock market. But, you know, having said that, um, one was, you know, at one point reading about how there was FOMO. Term sheets were being signed in a matter of a couple of hours. Um, so both from the founder's perspective and from the VC perspective, has all of that been rationalized? Has, has sanity come to re, uh, rule the market? It's certainly changing. And, you know, I've probably talked to uh, 40 to 50 ecosystem participants over the last week or so. Uh, this includes founders, our portfolio companies, as well as, uh, you know, investors. And there's definitely some level of pulling back from that FOMO, where term sheets are not being signed in, uh, you know, in two days. People are doing work, additional work. And I think founders, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's in the founders' hands. The very best founders understand that building a company and an institution. So I, I, have, I have this theory, right? So startups come together all the time. There may be like 2,000 startups being formed in India at any given point in time. Some of them, maybe call it 500 of them, end up becoming real companies. And by real companies, I mean, you know, organizations, very good uh, revenue, you know, value being created for customers, but very few of them end up being institutions that will endure the test of time. And the way you chart your path to being that institution is by involving uh, your mission and value yeah. systems very early on in the startup phase. So the very best founders are not looking for that two-hour term sheet. They are looking for someone who's going to be with them for 20 years. Mm, they're looking for a marriage which will not end in a divorce. Yes. Weddings are always fun. Marriages have ups and downs. Yeah. Right? And recently in the startup ecosystem, for better or worse, there has been a slew of bad news, right? Whether um, it is investor and founders coming head to head with Bharat Bay, uh, whether it is an EV which is blowing up in Pune, luckily no one getting hurt, which is Ola. So, you know, with someone... I mean, to interviewing someone so famous with a startup ecosystem and someone so revered and looked up to, what's the larger message out there? Is, is there any issues when you guys are looking in? Is there any concern in Silicon Valley when it comes to corporate governance or these kind of issues? So there are corporate governance issues everywhere, everywhere in, the, in world. the world. Everywhere in the world. Uh, you know, sometimes they get brought to light more in one place or the other. But corporate governance is a two-sided coin. It comes, you know, the great founders want good corporate governance because it makes them better and helps them build enduring companies and institutions. And the really good investors appreciate corporate governance because it's their fiduciary responsibility, both yeah. towards the company and their LPs. So if we take corporate governance from the perspective of engagement, such that all the participants are on the same side of the table and trying to do the best for the stakeholders, it's no longer an us versus them thing. Yeah. So I think we should change it and not call it corporate just corporate governance, because that feels like, you know, a teacher setting some rules. It should be corporate engagement. 
Okay. And everyone trying to get to the same goal, which is to have you know a value-based system, a good set of design principles of building that company that ultimately generates a lot of value for all the stakeholders. So, so values ultimately give us value. And I'm going to pick up on that point a little more. Um, a few days ago, I had the good fortune <clears throat> of uh, being able to interview Mr. Vinod Khosla of Khosla Ventures, who told me that if a company and a founder comes to me and says, I'm going to be delivering profit in two to three years, <laughs> I will not sign a check because it shows that the company is saying, I have limited growth. What is general catalyst view on all of this? So, you know, Vinod is a very, you know, I look up to him. He's been a great friend, advisor, and mentor to me over decades. And uh, I believe that he has very strong points of view. I can see, I wasn't, you know, I haven't seen the full interview, but I can see his point of view and what he may be saying. Uh, For example, you know, he said there would have been no AWS if Amazon had been going after profits. And I said, there's only one Amazon on this planet, <laughs> and everyone makes that comparison. So, you know, fascinatingly, I was going to give Amazon's example, and this is, this is how, this is how, right? So absolutely, I think Jeff Bezos in the early years always said that I am working for the long term and I want to keep reinvesting the dollars, which means you may not see EBITDA profitability. That does not mean my business does not generate profit. Hmm. There's a difference between the two. One is an accounting principle. The other is a business principle. In business principle, you know, as my dot dad, who never went to school, taught me, he said, Deko beta, you know, a good business is one where you put in a rupee in and you get a rupee and 30 paise out at the end of the year. Now, for several years, you may choose to invest in that business and not get the rupee and 30 paise out. That's called the investing phase. But there's always a phase which says, is this business viable or not? And you have to showcase viability. Jeff Bezos famously, ev you know, every so often in the early years of uh, Amazon, if you look at their quarterly earnings, would show a profitable quarter because he wanted the world to know that, look, I am a viable business. I'm just choosing to so reinvest back. So he did back. quarter, si quarter tak. He did, absolutely. If you go back and look at the financial reports, you'll see he, her, you know, six, eight quarters in, he would show profitability. And that told his investors that, look, this business is viable. He's choosing to reinvest. That's great because I want to build the net asset value of the business. And how yeah. do you do that? By investing in things Correct. that, you know, will help you generate future profitability. Okay. Well, that's great to hear because this is the conversation we are still having in India trying to figure out all of these companies and, you know, the stock markets are used to the quarterly results and earnings and, you know, discounted cash flows and figuring out valuations. I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah. But the other thing I'd love to get you... I mean, remember, I started my, you know, technology career after my startup mm -hmm. at Google. Yeah. And Google, we famously wrote in our S1 saying we are all about the long term. That was the first time founders ever wrote an open letter to their shareholders yeah. in their public filing. And we talked about this, and that's the ethos that I've grown up with in, yeah. in Silicon Valley, which is always think about the long term. That's very baked into the value system that I espouse and what we try to impart to our entrepreneurs. So as we do this long-term thinking and crystal ball gazing, um, is this going to be the season where you're expecting big markdowns, which will then obviously be followed by you know bad news, which usually happens, which is layoffs, etc.? So... Uh, the way companies are generating intrinsic value, we should not be seeing a lot of big markdowns. However, there are exogenous factors at work, right? Mm. We couldn't have predicted COVID. We couldn't have predicted a war in Europe. Uh, we may not be able to predict any such future exogenous event that happens. And when that happens, you know, a lot of things get swept in it. So there are businesses that are generating hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue growing 50, 60, 80% year over year, and they've been marked down 60, 70% in the stock market. What my friends in the public markets tell me is that they are spending a lot of time picking up because they're like, wow, for the first time in several years, we are getting bargains on amazing quality companies. So that's a point of view also mm -hmm. saying markdowns are happening, but they've been disproportionate and there is some value creation opportunities there for public market investors. So now as I start uh, winding down the interview, for all the founders that are tuning in, what does it take to get a check from General Catalyst? And like I said, you know, there's a very high pedigree before this, Airbnb, Snap, all of that. The thing that we look for are value-driven, impact-driven founders, first and foremost. That is very, very critical for us because we have seen, you know, collectively at General Catalyst and definitely me, having been in the tech ecosystem, 
we've built companies that have generated tremendous value, Google, LinkedIn. But then there were peer platforms such as Facebook and Twitter where because of gaps of unintended consequences that were created, you know, elections got swayed. And we cannot repeat those mistakes. As I was saying earlier, it's always good to be a student of business history and learn from it. Yeah. So I would encourage all the entrepreneurs to say, let's build value-driven, impact-driven startups that will become great companies and eventually great institutions. That's what we look for. Absolutely, you need to be in a big market. Absolutely, we'll help you with the execution and all kinds of other things that go alongside it. But the value and the impact mentality only the entrepreneur can bring to the table. That we cannot give someone. And with, you know, the world changing now, at least this year, with, you know, interest rates that are supposed to go up, uh, we've seen the hawkish commentary coming from the U.S. Fed, India's going to be doing it, all central banks are going to do it, money will be tighter. So I'm guessing fewer checks may also be written as we enter this tighter monetary regime. So VCs will, I'm guessing, be more selective in the founders that they will choose. Do you have a sin list? The kind of startups you will never go for, the kind of founders you will never go for. The, you know, it would be the opposite of, the answer would be opposite of the previous question, right? So if we encounter founders who are not impact and value driven, value driven. Define impact, what would impact be? Impact is again, more than profitability. Impact is a sum total of what do you stand for? One of the first questions we ask an early stage entrepreneur is, tell us your view of the world. Why are you building what you're building? And the answers can be very, very revealing and very instructive. What's the second there's no question? right answer. And what's the second question? How can we be helpful to you getting there? Because okay. it's a partnership. We mm -hmm. approach every relationship that we make. We don't write you know, thousands of checks a year. We have limited bandwidth. No matter how much capital we have to deploy, the number of people deploying it is still fairly limited. And we want to give our 110% to every founder we work with. So we want to make sure that it's a true partnership that we are going into from, from the very beginning. Okay. And um, as you do this uh, partnership and you do all of that, what happens when the cap table gets very messy and others also come and there are too many weddings that take place? You know, I am a big believer, uh, having been part of building some very, you know, sustainable institutions out there uh, in the tech world, that it takes a village. Okay. You know, uh, <laughs> a child is raised by not just their parents, but their extended families. Similarly, startups become companies and then eventually become institutions, not because of one, two, three, four or five people, but many, many people, uh, including the hundreds of employees that they would have who are, you know, in fact, the core engine of growth for any company. And so as more people come around the table as investors, it behooves the founders and the management team to say, pick and choose what you want to get from each one of us. We all bring different skills. We've seen so many different things in the world. Use that advice and wisdom. We want to couple the imagination and perhaps a little bit of ignorance of the founders that helps them go start a company and take that risk with the wisdom and insights that maybe some of us have brought through decades of work together. And that is what makes a great partnership. And uh, as you sign these limited number of checks and raise children in a village, uh, what are the, and because you're looking for impact, where? In Web 2, Web 3, uh, environment, climate change, healthcare? You know, uh, I right now sit on the board of a company that I invested in in my previous job that has the best antibody treatment for the pandemic. It saved countless lives. I've invested in a company that does early recognition of cancer without doing a biopsy. It does a liquid biopsy, so it draws blood. We started every board meeting with a video of the lives of pe people, of people's stories whose lives we positively impacted. Impact comes in different places. I don't mean places. it in a bad way, and I hope you will not take it in a bad way, but it is my job to ask. Yeah. Because when you're hearing about drawing blood, revolutionary technology, I hope it's not a Theranos, it's been done, tried, these are tested. These are public companies, FDA approved and being used by you know millions of people around the world now, and they have actually saved lives. And we. You know, the board meetings start with videos of people whose lives were saved. So, yeah. you know, very, very real. Uh, but at the same time, we also invest in financial technology companies that have, you know, help entrepreneurs, small, medium businesses, tier two, tier three cities, and bootstrap them up and help them give financial mobility and financial freedom. 
So impact, I think, comes in many flavors, right? Whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it's actualization, we have mental health, be you know, well-being companies uh, in India and around the world. So that's the kind of impact we are looking for. We are very interested in climate tech. You know, we've uh, not announced many of our investments, but several investments are being looked at, and we've made okay. a bunch of them. It's a very important issue that's facing all of us. And you know, if not for our own sakes, for the sakes of our children and their children, yeah. we should Planet. meet. <laughs> exactly. We should be, you know, and these are long decay function things. We have to do something today for the effect to show up 30 years from now. So here's uh, wishing you all the very best and uh, great to meet you in person. Thank you, Nantara. Such a pleasure meeting you as well.